Hello, this is the new Mercedes AMG A45. Mercedes is compact, mega hatchback, although actually a saloon and an estate and a crossover will also soon be available. But they all have one thing in common, and that is a monster engine, the most powerful series production two-litre engine there is in the world, which makes about 420 horsepower, unless you live in a market where you don't get the full-on S version, in which case you get about a 380 horsepower thing. But either way, it should be very fast. Drives through a twin-clutch eight-speed transmission back to a rear axle that has two clutches on the back as well to give it four-wheel drive and a variable torque vectoring and even a drift mode. So let's go and see what it's like on the road and also on the circuit. So welcome to the inside of the A45 on the road. In this car's more natural habitat, we'll go to the track in a minute, but we'll start off, see what it's like as a road car, which is actually what it is. First things first, this interior is, like all A-classes, really, really lovely. It feels, it feels really nicely put together. Ergonomics are, are pretty good from a driving position standpoint, less good from a driving control standpoint, partly because there are just so many different modes and so many things to pick from and so many ways to turn things on and off. And I, look, I'm a fan of buttons rather than a touch screen. So from that point of view, I'm a happy camper. But there's just a bit much going on. Too many different modes for dampers, gearbox settings, ESC settings, dynamic control, which actually changes the way the four wheel drive system works and I'd just be a little bit happier if they gave it one really good one and said we've set it up for you lads so you don't have to. But I found a kind of middling setting I've got my gearbox in in a slightly sporty drive mode and the dampers are in their middling mode and this car is quite relaxed when you want it to be the engine is quiet the gearbox is good actually it's a twin clutch eight speed unit and it, and it shifts gears pretty well if I want to take control myself that's down there and I now have it that's quick isn't it there's a time when a Mercedes gearbox would not give you it would not give you shifts that quickly and also this engine it's amazingly smooth not quite as raspy as the original A45 I don't think but if you want lots of power and let's face it this car has a lot of power and you can start to feel what's going on so I'm now on a fairly twisty road and even at moderate speeds you can feel the way this car shuffles its power around to make itself feel more agile it does it without active rear steer and I, some German engineers looked at me weirdly when I said have you tried active rear steer and I was like no it's a short it's a short car why would we want to do something like that but you know it is a it is a thing that Renault has tried with the Megan Trophy because the Renault of course is only front wheel drive. This has four wheel drive and it just really wants to rotate as you come out of a corner, as you come back on the power. And it's what it's doing really, it's not it's not doing anything funny with the steering, it's just going right. If I put a bit more power a bit more power to that corner on the way out of a right hander, it just helps the car turn itself around. So it feels really agile. Steering is sort of moderately weighted, quite quick, very precise. So you get the agility that you might get from a four-wheel steer hatchback. It feels almost, in, in, in its ethos, as much as anything, it feels like an old Mitsubishi Lancer Evo. Because it just turns and then it'll do things sort of as you get on the power and you go, wow, that's, that's turned quickly. Even though what's happening is that the the engine is obviously spinning and that is driving the drive shaft all the time at the same speed as effectively the front wheel. So effectively 50% of torque always goes to the back axle. And from then there is a clutch either side of that rear, open rear differential and that decides how much of that power it wants to send to an individual wheel. So it can send 100% of rear power to the outside wheel and it will do that. What it theoretically can't do is send more power to the back than the front, at least not intentionally. But if the front wheels start to spin, then 
it kind of just does that differential thing where they have grip that that doesn't so therefore more torque at the back reaches the road than at the front and that just helps it turn and turn more so you can put this car in a drift mode where it wants to do that whole just put loads of power I think to the outside rear but we'll find that when we come to it which I'll have to try and approach on the track on the road it's a it's a comfortable enough cruiser if you leave the suspension in comfort because honestly if you tick the box saying adaptive dampers and you put them in Sport Plus then on town roads it's better at speed but on town roads it can get a little on the lumpy side you can't why are you talking to me I don't want you to do anything for me just too just just too much just give it less am I turning into a grumpy old bum or is there just too much? So I got in this car and to turn off the lane keep assist. I'm trying to turn off this thing that shows you a front camera with some vague arrows on it on the nav. I don't, I don't want it. And then there's the blind spot assist that you can't just have a, a sensor. It has to be bit bonging at you. It can't just show the little light. So you just have to turn that off as well. It's just quite a lot of infuriation going on. There are some complications to deal with first, but in terms of its overall dynamics, I'm quite enjoying it. It's not a natural 50-50 Subaru Impreza WRX, the way it goes around corners, because of the way it vectors its torque. But it's not unpredictable. It's quite enjoyable. It feels natural enough. So let's see what it's like on track. We're at a place called Circuit de Harama, which is near Madrid, and it's great. It's a real handling circuit. There's loads of gradient and stuff like that, so it's a cool track. Right, I'm gonna stick it in race first of all, and uh, the ESC on, and then at some point, I'll put it in drift mode, which is yet another mode on mode. Really whips around this engine makes a really smooth quite a nice noise it's quite a linear thing revs to about seven and in the bump Mercedes says there is a sensor in the exhaust which monitors all the individual pulses and then amplifies those into the cabin so it sounds to me like they play it through the speakers but it doesn't sound really like it is played through the speakers it is stable in a straight line it's a big stop at the end of the main straight down here and it moves around just nicely but predictably under braking this car. The brakes on this car have been worked fairly hard already. Turns nice and willingly and what is good is that there is a resistance to understeer and as you get back on the power because it just shuffles it around at the rear to the side that has most grip it gives it a, a certainly at this speed we're not well up to on it pace yet there is a nice sort of neutral balance to it. Quite stable in high speed corners. Just took a little bit of curb there and it rides that quite nicely. And then just as you brake hard, there's a little shimmy. And as you turn in and push on, it does not understeer very much, if at all. And then as you come back on the power, it just straightens everything out really nicely. Is it as exciting, say, as an M2 competition? No, I don't think it is, but it is more exciting, I would say, than an Audi RS3. Oh, it's nice, actually, as you start to push the chassis a little bit, a little bit harder and get a bit of lateral force on it, then you can start to feel mid-corner, on and a corner exit particularly, the way the power starts to get shifted around. All right, I'm in manual. Let's first take everything off. This is where it starts. Sport handling mode, sport off, paddle up. Right, drift mode now active. Excellent. So that means that stability control is all off and the chassis should move around a bit. Now, unlike on an E63, say, that doesn't disconnect the front drive shafts because it's a transverse engine, predominantly front drive. What it does instead is it just puts as much as it thinks is sensible, or possibly more than it thinks is sensible, really, to the outside rear tyre on whatever bend you happen to be on. 
much. But when you get the chassis working, it really moves around in a really nice, playful, but not terrifying fashion, which is something I like a great deal. I do like it, you know, it's good fun. It does have a, a mobile chassis. The gear shift is still perhaps not as slick as the finest double clutch shifts are. Sometimes when you pull a downshift and you think you've got a few hundred revs to go into and it won't quite have it, and that's a way that Mercedes boxes have felt for a little while, which is a strange thing that I don't think you get in other cars. Maybe it just doesn't rev as high, but it is good fun. So the big competitor, I suppose, is the Audi RS3, and I think this has got the measure of that, just because, I mean, the engine may not sound as characterful because it's only four and not five cylinders, but it certainly has nothing to fear in terms of the way it generates its boat and the way it spins and how smooth it is. And what it couples that with is a chassis that is much more communicative. Not only more communicative, but more adjustable, more playful, more engaging. But then you've also got to consider, I would say, the BMW M2 competition, which is again about 50,000 pounds, is a slightly different car in that it only has two doors and four seats, whereas this is a proper, I suppose, sensible hatchback. But if it is usually you and the car and you want something a bit sporty, then I would say that the M2 would give you probably a bit more back a bit more often. However, there is a, there is a lot to like it, a lot of ability in a sensible package, sensible if expensive package, but in terms of its dynamics, it's grippy, it's adjustable, it's got poise. I think you'd probably have more fun in, perhaps unsurprisingly, in the actual proper sports cars of this sort of money. But what it does do, it does do very well. So if you need its unique set of abilities, by all means, have one of these. Me, I would sort of accept that my passengers are going to have to clamber into the back and get an M2 competition, but I can see if that doesn't totally suit everybody's life.